well, <clears throat> we're going to take a hard turn from that over to the Gospel of Matthew. And so if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn in Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 25. Um, yeah, the rest of the kiddos can go if you were hanging around for that. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles in the seats in front of you. You can grab those. If you don't own one, uh, then that's our gift to you. Uh, but this is our last section here in chapters 24 and 25. This can be viewed as one, one, pe- one sermon, if you will, of Jesus's or, or one, one large piece of instruction on the end times. And this is the last section in, in 25. In, tw- in chapter 26, we turn then towards the cross, towards Jesus' death and his resurrection and his ascension. Uh, we're going we're gonna to press pause, though, starting next week to celebrate Advent and look ahead to Christmas, which I'm really excited about, and then actually pick up Matthew uh, in February again, and we'll finish out. We've got it perfectly timed with Easter. We'll see how that goes. So uh, that's when we're going to complete Matthew. But today we're in this section in chapter 25. Um, and Jesus has been talking about the end times. Um, it's in, it's in, important to understand that these events are coming, that Jesus talks about his coming in terms of this really stark reality, and whether we believe it or not, it's happening. Jesus is coming, and we don't know the day or the hour, but he's coming, and we will know when it comes. It will not be a question. There will, no one's going to be wondering, is Jesus here? It will be so obvious according to the way that Jesus talks about it, and then he will gather his people together, and then he will judge all the peoples, and, and, and then fully establish his kingdom. And so we aren't in control of, of any of these circumstances. That's where we're heading. It's coming, and we aren't in control of them, but we are invited into these things. We are invited into the event of Christ's coming. A few weeks ago, we talked about the fact that, that we need to live as though that is our day. As Christians, as followers of Jesus, that's, it, that's not someone else's day. We need to live today as though that day is coming because it is, and we're invited into that. And so today, I want to talk about, as, as we've been looking at this and as Jesus has been talking, about this invitation into a response. We need to respond to Jesus' words. We need to respond to this, this invitation to, to come to him and to trust in him uh, and look ahead to that day. Uh, but that that response comes with a responsibility. Years and years and years ago, uh, Shannon and I met in a, in a ministry called Covenant Players. It's a traveling drama ministry. It sounds as awesome. It is, was as awesome as it sounds. Uh, it's a traveling drama ministry, and we were put on these teams with people, and they, they put you in these really old, decrepit vans, and you go out uh, to all parts of, of the, the United States to your assigned area, and you perform dramas in schools and churches and nursing homes and all that stuff. And so we drove from L.A. to, to Pennsylvania, in like 48 hours or something, like nonstop, you know, just eating cup of noodles along the way at gas stations and stuff. And I have to admit, I was, I was young at the time, I was 19, and my experience with road trips up until that point was, you sleep. You, you sleep so that it goes by faster, and you wake up to eat. And so that's what I did. I joined this drama ministry, and Shannon tells it a little differently. She's a little less merciful towards me when, I, you know, when she tells the story. But uh, I was a complete idiot, uh, just slept the whole way, and I would only wake up to eat and then go back to sleep. And certainly, and she says now, like, what, who is this guy? He's just this total just loser, freeloader. And I was. I was behaving that way. I had responded to this concept of getting into a van and going on this with, with this ministry to go out and, and do these things, but I hadn't taken any responsibility from the get-go. There was no sense of responsibility that I needed to be part of this team and in that case be a part of going, getting to where we were going. There was no responsibility. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. Jesus continues to talk about this sense of responsibility that we have as Christians The Christian life isn't about just kind of getting in the van and going to sleep, so to speak, and just sort of waiting around to go to heaven one day. That's not what this Christian life is about or for. It's about stepping into, not just in response, 
and, and praying a prayer and saying, yes, I believe in Jesus, all those things are critical and very important. There is now a responsibility that we, the people of God, have towards one another and towards the world around us. So let's read this. There are sections in Scripture that when you read them, you're like, oh, man, that's like a warm hug. This is so fuzzy, and it just makes me just, just feel great. This isn't one of those sections. So I'm just going to read the whole thing, verses 31 to 46, and then we'll go from there. Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did, you, would we, when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. I feel like I need to pray. Lord, uh, I pray that you'd lead us in this time together. This is not light reading. These are heavy things for many of us to hear and to even wrap our minds around. I pray that your spirit would lead us. I pray that you would guide us in truth, Lord. Um, I pray, uh, Lord, that you would stir in us uh, a desire to know more and to want more and to, to, to know you more, not just have information, but to know you more. And I pray, God, that you would convict us, but that you would also encourage our hearts here this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple things I just want to look at here, and, and you guys need to know, like some of you might be a little frustrated here today because there is so much going on in this passage. We're not going to be able to hit it all or touch it all. I might kind of skim the surface of some things and then go a little bit deeper into to some other things. But my hope is this, that this maybe even stirs up some study for you and you want to you do some further things and, and conversation. I'd love to talk uh, with any of you about these things in depth. But I want to look at just some of, the, some of the things of what's going on here, just sort of identifying, kind of stating the obvious a little bit. Let's talk about the event, just the event of what Jesus is describing here. We've had three parables that have led up to this section here. We've had the parable of the servant. We've had the parable who takes care of the household. We have the, the parable of the ten virgins and the oil for the lamps, right? And then we have the parable of the talents, the three different people uh, wh whose master gave them different talents, and then they came back and had to give an account for those things. So three parables that really have to do with the response that we, as, as the people of God, as disciples of Christ, need to have when it comes to the end times and how we are to live in responsibility towards those things. This is not a parable. This is not one of those things. Although Jesus does use a, uh, an example or uses an illustration, he's talking about actual events here. This is not a story that he's telling to communicate some, uh, an important truth. He's talking about actual future events. And central to this scene is Jesus. 
Jesus is central, and he's called a ton of things in this passage. Like, it's really packed. Up until this point, Jesus has been a little bit veiled about his identity at some points. Like, he talks a lot about himself as the son of man, as he does here, and we've sort of addressed what that is and what that means. Son of man is this, it's this prophetic title that we see in Daniel, but it's also this way that he just liked to associate himself with mankind for whom he came to give himself, right? So son of man, but he also, we're introduced to Jesus as king, as Lord, uh, like these really, really, really big titles, and he's on the throne where the king belongs. He's on the throne, and he's holding court on his throne, and he's gathered all of the angels and all of the nations, just like New York's hottest club, everyone will be there. All of the angels, all of the nations are gathered together for this one huge event where Jesus is on his throne and the occasion is final judgment. That's what the king does. That's what the king gets to do. In any kind of uh, monarchy, we know that the king or the queen has final say. They're the one who have rightful place to the throne. They can make laws. They can disband laws and they judge either rightly or wrongly. And yet what we know here is that Jesus is the righteous judge. And there's two groups of people that are gathered here. There's the sheep and the goats. This is the illustration that Jesus gives us. There's the sheep on one hand on the right, on the, your right, on the right hand, and the goats are on the left. There's the blessed and the cursed. There's the righteous over on this side. Those are the sheep. Those are the blessed. And Jesus is using, he's, he's kind of borrowing from a real common thing that people back then would have seen. As, this, as a shepherd would come back into the fold for the evening, he would separate the goats from the sheep. I'm not entirely sure why they would do that. Maybe there's some quick little Google search that can be done to figure that out. But that's what would happen. And so Jesus is using this really common image like, yeah, there's a separation of sheep and goats. And so Jesus says, just like that, that's the illustration, just like that, he is going to sit on his throne and separate the two groups of people. I think it's important to note that at the end of all things, when Jesus comes to judge all people, there will only be two groups the blessed and the cursed, the sheep and the goats. There's not a third, there's not a fourth. There's two groups of people. And with that judgment that Jesus casts, there are two destinations. One is eternal life and one is eternal punishment. What we call heaven and hell. Jesus talks about it in terms of his father's kingdom. And when he speaks to the blessed, to the sheep, he says, enter into, he invites them in, come into my Father's kingdom that he's prepared since the beginning of time. And yet there's also a place prepared uh, that, that Jesus refers to as hell, Gehenna. It's this place of outer darkness. It's a place that's described here using fire. And I don't know if that's metaphorical uh, even if it is metaphorical, it's metaphorical for something really terrible. It is, it is a place that is away from the presence of God and is described here as an eternal punishment. It's something awful. And so we have this two groups of people, the blessed, the sheep, are going to enter into the kingdom, and the goats, the cursed, are going to enter into this separation, this eternal punishment uh, that is described here in this case by fire. In other places in this same sermon, Jesus talks about it as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, of remorse, of anguish, of regret. And Jesus talks about these things very matter-of-factly. He does not mince words, but he does not go into great detail either. And so I think we, we can kind of get preoccupied with maybe the essence of these things and what exactly is this. And, you know, we can, we can even go off on, on, on things and as far as the word punishment and what is that and what is it not and, and all these things. And yet what we need to do is just take Jesus for, at his word at this point in the context as we're looking at this passage for our purposes here today. There's a, there's a time and place for study like that, but we're not going to do that today, that there are two places 
one that I want to go to and one that I would like to avoid. But I think in some ways that's the point. And so I want to ask this just, just briefly here. Um, I, I don't know about you. When I read this passage, it, it, it's, it's kind of freaky. Like there's this sense of like, there's, it, that's scary. I don't, I don't want to go to that place that's destined for the gods. How can I make sure that I'm on this, in this group that's on the right hand of Jesus and not in this group? Because I want to enter into this blessedness and this kingdom. I don't want to enter into what is being described by fire and weeping and gnashing of teeth as eternal punishment. Is fear of hell a good reason to trust in Jesus? You think about that? Maybe you've grown up in the church. And you remember putting your faith in Jesus because you were, you were afraid of punishment. You were afraid of this thing that Jesus talks about as this 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 place that's away from God, and so we put our trust in Jesus. Is fear of hell a good reason to go, you know what, I want to be in that group, so I'm going to go ahead and believe that Jesus died and rose again? I think the answer is no and yes. I think it's both. And it really is determined by how it is that you approach this reality. Fear can move us. Fear does move, and it's actually a really good motivator. When when our kids were really little, we were hiking up in Sedona, and Jesse is just a daredevil. He has no, no, like, he he just always has been this way, and he was really small, and he took off on us and ran over just, just full speed over to this cliff. And I freaked out, right? Because you're just, you're just imagining your kid just not stopping and just running over the cliff. So in fear, my senses kicked in. I was like, whoa, Jesse, stop, stop, stop. And I ran over and I grabbed him. That's a good thing. Like there, there are times where fear motivates us to, to, to protect, to make sure that things are right and whole, right? However, we can't live there. So in a circumstance like that, I couldn't live the rest of the hike just holding Jesse and just you know, looking around, making sure that he's not going to hurt himself everywhere. We don't live in fear, but I do think that there is an aspect of fear that is motivating. And again, if you're prone to anxiety and fear, you're not meant to live there. So I do think there is a, there is a place here for us to read this and go, that's scary. I don't want to be in that group. Jesus, I want to follow you and put my faith and trust in you. I think that's fear that pushes us towards the positive, although we don't live there. Because the Bible says that we, do not know, we no longer have that spirit of fear in us through Christ Jesus. We have the spirit of life that has cast out that need for fear. So if there's this fear that moves you to want to at least know more about Jesus and to even begin to wade into maybe believing this reality of these two groups of people in these two destinations, I would say that's a good thing, but I would say don't live there. You don't need to stay in that fear as you discover, if you discover the truth of Christ and and put your faith in him. Fear must give way to love. Fear gives way to love. I think Jesus is saying here that this day of judgment is coming and we will find ourselves in one of these two groups. See, on the other hand, we don't want to be just so just rejecting of any kind of negative feelings or attitudes that we become passive about our faith, that we become lazy about it and use the grace of God to excuse our sin and our rebellion and our passivity. Paul says to work out our fear, uh, work out our salvation with this fear and trembling, that there's this wrestling. And I will say, as I've gotten older, as I've, as I've gotten to know Christ more and I've gotten to know his word more, I, I still, there's this wrestling with, man, I want to I wanna live in a way, I want to live in a way that honors God. And ultimately, I want to be in that group. I want to be among the sheep, not the goats. We need to wrestle with these things. And I think Jesus invites us into responding so that we would take on this, a sense of responsibility. And I hear this, and that's my first thought, is I want to be among the sheep. So 
How do I make sure I'm among the sheep? And so Jesus, then we have this separation. Jesus separates the sheep and the goats. And my question is, what is it that makes these two groups of people so different from one another? What makes them so different? And if you, if you read this passage real quickly, it almost sounds like what makes them different. It really, actually really sounds like what makes them different is what they did, right? The sheep, they took care of the needy. And the goats ignored the needy. Ipso facto, right? Care of the two, blah, blah, blah. Jesus looks at what we do, and that's the most important thing. And so that's the question. Are they so different, the sheep and the goats, because of who they are? Are they already sheep walking into the situation? Already goats? Is it, is it because of who they are, or, is, or is they, are they so different because of what they did? Is it the who or the what? Because if it's the what they did, then we're talking about a works-based salvation. And here's what I mean by that, if you don't know what I'm talking about. It's this idea that God does. He keeps a tally of the way that we behave. And if we're generally good people, when it comes to this throne and this time of judgment, God, Jesus is going to look at our kind of list of inventory and go, okay, your column of good outweighs your column of the bad things that you did. Come on in. And so God is just constantly watching to make sure that we don't screw up. That's, a, that's living, that's remaining in fear. That's called a works-based salvation, which in fact is not salvation at all. The Bible speaks very clearly to the reality that, that we aren't saved by our works. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. Paul's very, very, very blatant and obvious, very black and white about that. We're, not sa- we're saved by faith, and even the faith that we have is not our own, so that we can't brag about it. That's the wonderful thing about, the, about God and, and, and Christ, who is God and who came here as a man and who died and who rose again, is that he sees us with all our faults, with all our mistakes, with all of just uh, the ugliness of our past, and he loves us, and he invites us in to his grace, into his forgiveness. There may be even some of you listening right now, either in the room or online, and and you've bought into this works-based salvation system, and what you feel like is that you've dug your hole so deep that you're not going to be able to good deed your way out of this thing. And so why even try? And I would say rather than despair in that, take hope in that, because that's where God finds us, at the bottom of the pit, and he pulls us out. The Bible's clear that there's nothing we can do to earn eternal life. It comes through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus came and died. Jesus came and died on a cross, lived a sinless life, gave himself up, shed his blood, and died, and then rose again. Why would he do that if we also still needed to earn God's favor? The Bible says that that, that Christ did that, that he did what we could not do so that we could enter into the rest that God has for us through Christ. It's noteworthy that Jesus calls the sheep blessed by my father and the goats cursed. That's an identifier. They're sheep because they've been blessed by the father and they're goats because they're cursed. And yet Matthew also, uh, when in writing the gospel, we have a lot of this like, sense of responsibility that we are to take as followers. Jesus in the gospel of Matthew is not promoting a work salvation. We actually don't have to leave Matthew to, to know this, to see that. So for instance, in Matthew 7 or Matthew 12, Jesus talks about, he uses the illustration of a tree. You will know a tree by its fruit, right? An apple tree doesn't produce bananas, Right? So, in other words, the, the, the works that are produced, the way that we live our lives, that reveal the type of person we are already. It reveals our identity. It shows already in this life which, which group we're going to be in. There's this response to the gospel, but there's also this responsibility and this call to follow after Christ and to live into that identity that we have. What we do is a product of who we are. I find this really interesting, actually, because um, if you think about this, 
Matthew's really heavy on this responsibility that we have as followers of Jesus Christ. Um, we don't get just to just sit back and do nothing about it. And what we know and what a lot of Bible scholars believe is that Matthew, Matthew's audience, as he wrote this, was primarily a Jewish audience. You would think that because of that, Matthew would talk way more about grace and not works of the law, right? And yet, I think one of the things that I see here is that Matthew, in, in, let's say he is, let's say he, and I think he is, he's talking to a largely Jewish audience. Much of what he's doing here is saying Jesus gets to determine what is righteous and unrighteous. So in their framework of righteousness and unrighteousness, they did not separate the identity of righteous, which is a true thing, that we are made righteous through the blood of Christ. They didn't separate that from the actions of righteousness. They go together just as Jesus is talking about here. But it's Jesus, the judge, who is God, who sits on the throne, who gets to decide and determine what is right and what is wrong. And these people here, the sheep, uh, another thing that I just want to point out here, that we, we don't have a works-based salvation that, uh, here, is they didn't know they were actually ministering to Jesus when they were doing those things. If we have works-based salvation, they knew exactly what they were doing. They would have worked hard at giving the thirsty a drink of water or giving the hungry food, right? But they, that, that's not what it was about. They, just, they were like, oh, what? And Jesus is like, yeah, well, when you did those things, you did it to me. And they were like, wow. Because they're already sheep. And then they just stepped into it with their actions. It's this image that Jesus gives us of the vine and the branches. If we abide in him, we will bear fruit. And so there's this invitation to a response and a responsibility. And the responsibility that Jesus emphasizes here is care for the least. It's care for the least. He says, least of these my brothers. And there's some debate about, is Jesus talking about, hey, make sure that you're caring for, actually, I mean, the, the original word is brothers and sisters. And is Jesus saying, okay, we got to make sure that we're caring for other Christians? He could very well be saying that. And yet there's also this other side that says, well, but we're also to love our neighbor, and perhaps Jesus is associating with himself as, this, as a son of man, associating himself with all of humankind as, as this. Um, I would say either way, we're called into loving those around us, whether they're our brothers or sisters in Christ or our neighbor who don't yet know Christ. The least, the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the sick, the outsider, the imprisoned, Jesus giving attention to the needy, um, he's talking about um, giving attention to the needy um, and the need for social action that is rooted in the gospel. I'm going to uh, step into a minefield here, if you don't mind. Uh, I don't believe Jesus is talking about what we are coming to know as social justice. Um, I'm not going to go on long about this, but there is a term called social justice, and I, it's, been, it's, it's taken me a while to understand what it is and, and what it means because it sounds really good. I mean, justice is all throughout Scripture. There's this aspect of we're supposed to in a, have a social sense to care for those around us, and yet what I'm understanding, this is where words and terms are really, really important, especially these days, is it seems to me, based on what I've been learning and reading, is that social justice is actually an ideology that is based on a framework of this looking at the world through the lens of there are those who are oppressed, and there are those who are the oppressors, and that's it. And I don't see that as a biblical model. In fact, what I see here from this passage is that there are those who are righteous and then those who are unrighteous. And there's a lot of problems that develop from that ideology, from that framework of believing that the world is divided into those two separate groups of people. So I'm not talking about that. And we can talk more about that. And, 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 and you need to understand, too, that there are, there are systems and ideologies all around us. There are political views and all things. And we can look at any one of them and go, hey, there's some good things contained in that. But also be critical of it and go, but that's man-made. That's not from God. Uh, there, there is a better way. 
And so what I'm all about right now in this minefield that we're all walking through is what's the radical middle that Jesus is leading us through? We talk in, in these just crazy extremes and then cancel people when they're not in our camp. What's this radical way that Jesus is calling us to? And the answer is not to throw out social action. There are well-meaning Christians on both sides that are saying, oh, well, yeah, you know what? We can't, we gotta be all about preaching the gospel. Like people just need to hear that Jesus loves them and he died on a cross for them and that they're going to hell if they don't put their faith in him. And then over here you have really well-meaning Christians going, yeah, but that just, that sounds really impersonal and all these things. We need to be about serving the least of the, the people in our, in our culture and our society. We need to go out and make sure that, that, that people know the love of God by our actions and are serving them. And I would say Jesus did both. He stood in that radical middle where he preached things like hell, but he also healed the sick. And he ate with sinners. And he lived his life as a demonstration of the words that he was speaking. We need both. I believe Jesus is calling us into social action in the name of Christ, to the glory of God, with the message of the gospel, but doing so because we The people of God, the church of God, are meant to be the new humanity, this foretaste of the group of sheep that are entering into the kingdom, blessed by our Father. We are to be blessed not to hoard that blessing, but to share that blessing. And it comes through the spoken word, but it also comes through action, actions of love and caring for the least around us. I believe Jesus did both. So who are the least? Jesus sees and cares about the least, and so should we. The least are poor. They're last. They're forgotten. They bring no value, no seeming value. Have nothing seemingly to give. And there's a somewhat mysterious reality that Jesus is there among the least. You almost get this sense of, like, there's almost an invitation here for us as followers of Jesus. If you're in that place where you're like, man, I just don't feel Jesus right now. I I know he's real, but I'm just, I don't feel near him. We are to read our, our, our Bible. We're to pray. But I think there's an invitation here even to, to go find Jesus among the least, among the poor. That's where he is. And the least do have something to give us. In a really mysterious way, it's Jesus. Whether they know it or not. As you did to the least of these, you did it unto me. That's profound. That's something we need to wrestle with. He will lead us, Jesus will lead us to care for the needy, and it is there that we will encounter him. Jesus sees the smallest acts of kindness and compassion. So he sees the least people, and he also sees the smallest act of kindness and compassion. A bit of food, a cup of water, a shirt, a visit to the hospital or to prison. These are all really accessible things, aren't they? They're not like these huge, profound, like ministry, like awesome, amazing things, are they? They're just little things. An early church father named Chrysostom pointed out from this passage that Jesus doesn't say, I was sick and you healed me, or I was in prison and you liberated me. It's simple. I was sick and you came to see me. I was thirsty and you gave me a cup of water. This is wonderfully liberating for us. We ought to hear this and go, oh, man. Like, I'm just, I'm just supposed to do these acts of kindness and, and, and these small things that communicate some of this really bigger, more profound truth. And I have to be honest with you, there's something about this that I'm like, aw. Because Jesus seems to say that he sees small ministries 
He sees the small little things. And you might be here feeling super insignificant about what it is that you have to give or to offer. Do you have a bit of food? Do you have a cup of water? That's what Jesus sees. Is these things that go seemingly unnoticed. But I, in my heart, in my pride, I want, I want to be about big ministry. I want to grow. I want to, I want to do healing stuff. I want to do things that we can measure and account for. I want to do big program. I want to be spirit moved. I want to have an impact. I want to be talent driven. And there's this assumption that I'm going to stand before Jesus one day. He's going to go, man, like this, that, and the other thing. Like, that was awesome. And yet Jesus sees the cup of water and the food. He's not about that big ministry that we all seem to care about so much. It's the small things. It's the small little unseen ministries that he calls us into. I have to reckon with Matthew 7, 21 to 23, all the way back into this section. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And, they, and then I, will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. It's not big ministry. It's the little ministries that we're called into. That's where our responsibility lies. The will of God is humble obedience and love. I want to end with this invitation. I noticed that there are three times in Matthew, there's three times only in Matthew where Jesus says, come, where there's an invitation. The first one is in Matthew 4.19. When he's calling his disciples, he says, come follow me. Uh, your translation may not say have come there, but it's in there. That the actual Greek word is there. I don't know why we don't have it there. It just says, in the ESV, it just says, follow me. It should say, come, follow me. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So there's an invitation to follow. There's an invitation into rest. And then this third one is here in our text. Come, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Jesus is constantly inviting us in to following him, to rest in him, and to ultimately inherit his kingdom with him. And so I have a couple of words for you this morning. If you hear and you read this passage in Matthew 25 and you're really freaked out by Jesus' words in this section, for, and pay attention to that fear. What, ask yourself, why do I feel that way? What's, what's there? And if you've not put your faith in Jesus, well, that's what's there. Maybe you're coming to terms for the first time that this might be the actual reality, that Jesus will sit on his throne and separate into two groups of people, and you want to be in the right group. Follow that desire. Let's talk some more. Let's talk about how the love of God then draws us deeper into. The fear perhaps has opened your eyes to go, oh, I got to do something, but it's the love that draws us in. But if you're a follower of Christ and you read this and you're kind of freaked out about it, then I want to draw your attention to Jesus' invitation to come and rest. If you feel heavy laden, if you feel weary and labored, pay attention to that invitation in Matthew to come rest. If, on the other hand, you hear this and you go, okay, like, when's lunch? And there's this passive dismissal of these things. Then your invitation is to come follow. Come follow. What does it look like to follow Jesus obediently? By putting your trust in him, loving him, and loving the people around you. My hope and my prayer is that we would all be able to enter into and, and respond to that invitation to come into his kingdom on that day. We have one chance. The Bible says, hey, don't delay while the Lord's near. While he's calling you, don't delay. 
Put your faith and your trust in Christ and follow after him. This concludes Jesus' teaching ministry in Matthew, this really heavy section of Matthew 24 and 25. In fact, if you go to the next chapter in verse 1, it says, When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. In all these things, we've got to remember, we've got to keep the cross in mind. Jesus is about to become the least for us. Let's pray. Father, I pray, um, Lord, I pray that in your grace and your kindness, you would just meet every one of us where we are in our hearts and minds right now. Lord, I pray that you would give us uh, spirits that are willing to have conversation, to, to talk about these things, to work these things out, to understand the tensions that we live in as followers. Lord, I pray that your love would cast out fear. But I also pray that you would not allow us to remain passive. And so maybe get our attention, Lord, in ways that only you know how. That we might trust you and be obedient to you and serve the least around us in seemingly insignificant ways. God, may that be true of us, that we would get to that day. And we would say, gosh, when did we do that to you, Jesus? You would say, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Lord, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for this time now that we turn towards communion and remembering what you've done for us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward. and We're going to uh, remember Christ's death and life through communion. Uh, and on your own time, you can come forward and take those elements, taking the bread, reminding, remembering that it represents Christ's body broken for us, and the cup representing Christ's blood shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. So you can come forward and take those, and then take them on your own time back at your chair. So ushers, go ahead and come forward. And I just want to read this to us, and then I'll sit down and um, invite you forward. In Isaiah 55, it says, Come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon.